Will someone nominate a temporary convener? I have to nominate uh, Michelle Valentine. Thank you. Any others? <coughs> nope. In that case, on being nominated, can I ask the committee to confirm that it is happy for me to be temporary convener until the committee appoints a convener? Yes, yeah. Happy. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, can I welcome everyone to the 17th meeting of, the of 2018 of the Social Security Committee and just remind everyone to turn off their mobile phones or any other devices um, to silence so that we don't disrupt the meeting. Um, apologies have been received from Mark Griffin and Pauline McNeil will be joining us um, shortly. Um, she's running later this morning. So I'd like to move us to agenda um, the, the main agenda, item one, which is Register of Interests. Um, and I'd like to welcome the new committee members. Um, Bob Doris is replacing Claire Adamson. Uh, Shona, yes, you are here, you just arrived. Morning, Shona. Um, so Shona Robson is in place of Ben McPherson and Alistair Allen in replace of Ruth Maguire. So welcome to the committee. Right, now I'm going to move us to item two, which is when we actually choose our convener. So the Parliament has decided, um, oh sorry, forgot to invite you to declare your interests. <laughs> Do you want to start with Shona? Yeah, mm. No interest to declare. <coughs> Alastair? Nothing particular, I refer people to my register of interest, but nothing particular Thank to you. declare. Bob. Yeah, similar to Alastair, uh, nothing to declare, but I refer people to my register of interest. Thank you. Okay, so back to item um, two, the choice of a convener. So the Parliament has decided that members of the Scottish National Party are eligible to be chosen as convener. So I'd like to invite a nomination for convener. Bob Doris. Thank you, Mr. Adam. So Bob Doris is our nomination. Does the committee confirm that Bob Doris is chosen as convener? Congratulations. Thank you. You are now convener. So. <laughs> Okay, Kate, I'll let you take over. <laughs> I feel a bit isolated here. You've been welcome to have sat, sat beside me. I hope that's, not a, hope that's not a sign of things to come. Bear with me one moment. Okay, so uh, I think it's only reasonable. I, I promise you we'll get to our witnesses in a second, but I wouldn't be doing my job properly if I didn't uh, thank uh, George and the committee uh, for nominating me and agreeing me to be convener of this committee. Uh, I very much look forward to it, but also to pay tribute to the, the work of Claire Adamson, who uh, did a sterling job here with some real pretty important legislation going, go, going through this committee. Um, uh, over over the, the previous few months. And of course, to congratulate Ben McPherson, who's been elevated to ministerial level, and Ruth McGuire has moved on to be a committee convener also. So just put on my record, my thanks to the three outgoing members of the committee who have, along with the rest of the members, laid pretty good groundwork for where we are as a committee, and I'm delighted to take over as, as convener. So we'll now move to agenda item three. And the committee is asked to agree that item five, consideration of evidence, is taken in private. Can I ask if the committee is agreeable to that? Okay. So we now move to agenda item four, social security and in work poverty. Agenda item four is the first evidence session of this inquiry into social security and in work poverty. Uh, this session will consider some of the published research in poverty and low pay. Uh, can I welcome the first witnesses for our inquiry, who are uh, David Finch, Senior Research Fellow, Resolution Foundation, Russell Gunson, Director, Institute for Public Policy Research Scotland, and Robert Joyce, Associate Director, Institute of Fiscal Studies. Um, I don't have a note, note here saying there's any opening statement, so are we going straight? straight to We're questions. going straight to questions. Okay. Uh, now, I know a, a, a lot of, of members, myself included, are keen to ask about uh, in-work conditionality in, in relation to, to universal credit. But I suppose before we ask specific questions on that, uh, universal credit, one of the policy intents behind it was to tackle in-work poverty. Um, and the data we have from submissions and, and published information out there is that 64% of those living in poverty 
urban households where there is a, uh, there is employment, there is work. Um, I don't know if that's a reflection on universal credit itself or whether it's too early to say there's a link between that or the, as those figures going up or down. But I'd be interested to know in terms of the current levels of households where people are in employment but they're still in work poverty and where we are with universal credit. So some observations on that I think would be quite helpful before we start looking at in work conditionality. Yeah, I think um, the Grant. place to start from from our point of view is that you can't divorce the economy from in work poverty. So yes, universal credit and social security more generally have a big role to play in reducing and tackling poverty and in work poverty. Um, the economy, the income structure in Scotland and across the UK will be as much, if not more, of an issue in terms of tackling in work poverty. And over the last 10 years, we have had some pretty unprecedented economic circumstances. We continue to have unprecedented circumstances. 150 years since we've seen living standards stagnate like they have um, over that period. And of course, low pay has been a big um, feature of the labour market and the economy over that time. Just under a fifth um, in Scotland are on wages beneath the living wage, the real living wage, should I say. But on to universal credit, um, I think where we stand is that it's in, as an idea, it's got some merit, bringing six means-tested benefits into one on a taper, a single taper is a good positive idea. But the funding levels that were originally promised have dropped significantly. We've seen about £3 billion taken out of the budget per year. And then, of course, you've got the ethos, almost the implementation of it, which to us looks particularly pernicious um, around in-work conditionality, work requirements, sanctions, etc. So whether um, universal credit will work or not has to relate to those three, the structure of it, the, the funding of it, and the way it's implemented. The structure has some merits, but the way uh, it's been funded and the way it's been implemented will make it firstly very difficult to know if it makes a difference or not. And secondly, I think there's some headwinds uh, that it's almost created for itself. Thank you. Others want to comment on that, Mr Joyce? Sure. I'll come in there. So I guess just to start with the overall trends in in-work poverty, um, the, the kind of big picture background, um, Broadly speaking, the, the, the overall rise over time in the proportion of people in poverty who are in a working household, that's been going on for, for some time. So that, that's not itself a, a universal credit related phenomenon. Um, that, I think you can, you can break that down into having three different causes, actually, very broadly. One is that employment has risen a lot. So less of the poverty problem is about worklessness than it used to be. So that's, that's the sort of good side. The other is that, and this is particularly a story of the last decade or so, although it actually predates the crisis a little bit as well, uh, is, is low earnings growth. And if anything, that's been particularly the case for households at the bottom end of the, of the earnings distribution. Um, and the third is uh, the big decline in pensioner poverty, actually. So all of those things combined mean that a much bigger fraction of our poverty problem than it used to be is about people who are in work not earning enough to take them above the poverty line and less about the things in the, that more drove it in the past, which were, which were uh, worklessness and, and, and poverty and old age. Of course, those problems are still there, but just as a, as a proportion of the total, they, they are smaller. Um, so I think that's sort of how I would see the big picture context for some of what you uh, said. Um, in terms of how universal credit will uh, affect in work poverty, I guess I'll break that down into at least two different categories as well. First of all, there's what are the direct impacts that it will have on households incomes and of working households incomes, given that it changes what different people are entitled to. And there it's a mixed, it's definitely a mixed bag. Um, there are a significant group of working households who will keep more benefits under universal credit than they would have kept under the old system. So in that direct sense, that will increase their incomes or top up their incomes and would tend to act to reduce in work poverty. Um, so in particular, uh, in work renters tend to do relatively well in terms of entitlements to benefits under universal credit. And one way of thinking about that is that's basically because they're the people who under the current system are typically losing both housing benefits and tax credits as they increase their earnings. Whereas now those two things are combined, there's only one 
tapering rather than two going on. And so they, they, they essentially lose their benefits overall at a slower rate because they're only subject to one means test at any one time, not two. Um, on the other hand, there are plenty of working households who lose, uh, and particularly those who, who own their home, but many others as well uh, lose. Um, the other aspect of universal credit, of course, or the other several aspects of universal credit are the non-financial ones. So perhaps we'll come on to conditionality in more detail later, um, but those are all going to be really important as well. Okay, thank you. Mr Finch? Sure. Um, so I think it's, it's definitely too early to say that universal credit is really having an impact on those kind of poverty figures at the moment, partly because especially when the, um, the survey would have been done, then universal credit really wasn't getting anywhere near being rolled out to anybody. I mean, it still isn't. So I think it will, it will take time before we see that. Um, I think just to add um, a little bit to some of those longer term trends, I think... Um, there's definitely been the um, reduction in worklessness, so more families being in work. Um, but what we haven't seen at the same time is any real reduction in the proportion of people in low pay. And we know that if you are stuck in low pay, then only a small proportion of those people will escape. Um, so different pieces of research we've done in the past suggest it's something between only a quarter or a sixth actually managed to escape from low pay ten years within ten year period. And so I think... Um, the combination of those two things are partly driving this um, this increase in um, in the proportion of people in poverty who are in work. Um, I think there's something else that has happened is, um, especially with relevance to universal credit, is the importance of um, the in-work support that people get um, to whether or not they'll be in poverty or just in general to their incomes. And that's partly the increase in generosity to the system through the kind of 2000s. Um, and it's also the increase in renters as well. So more families are getting... Um, support through the housing benefit system so the amount of support within the system for those lower income working families is playing a bigger role um, in whether or not they're in poverty essentially um, and some work we've done recently looking at um, under reporting of benefits um, within the kind of survey data suggests actually it's played a bigger role than the kind of surveys pick up so i think um, that just kind of underlies the um, the importance of universal credit in the future. Um, I think the one other financial gain that I don't think um, Rob picked up on is the kind of the, t the um, gains from take-up. So because it's the single benefit, more families will get everything that they're entitled to. And actually, that's probably going to benefit um, the, some of the lowest income households the most. So there are some positives to universal credit, even though um, overall we think it's going to make families um, overall worse off. Thank you. That's helpful. I might start off some questions around conditionality and then open up to, to, to other, other members. And clearly, this committee will want to scrutinise uh, where potential weaknesses could be because we'd like to see the situation improved. And I certainly know constituents of mine who have not had to previously engage with the, if you like, the benefit system in this way, because working tax credits didn't quite work like that. It was a different beast, if you like. Have have concerns about that engagement. When I mean, you use expressions like conditionality, people get very nervous. They hear conditionality, sometimes they, they think sanction uh, is what they think. So my understanding from looking at my notes is that the, the intention is that uh, it will be hours based in terms of uh, getting universal credit in relation to those that are in work. It will be income base. So the hope will be that uh, those those individuals will qualify if they manage to get the monthly income based on a 35 hour week at the minimum wage over 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 that month and all the fluctuations that there can be therein. Now I understand whether that's right or wrong is another matter, but I, I understand that. Uh, I also understand that there's been a a light touch approach to those on universal credit at the moment in relation to conditionality um, and requirements that could be placed upon them. Um, and that there's a residual sanction rate of 2% from my, from my notes in relation to that. And that the, the UK, or the DWP was doing a randomised control trial for those moving on to uh, this system. Helpfully or unhelpfully, I believe that uh, report's out this morning. Uh, so you may not have the chance to look at it. I have a very brief opportunity to look at it. And if I could read out one, one paragraph uh, from that, it says the evaluation uh, explored the link between sanctions and outcomes amongst frequent and moderate support participants by asking whether their universal credit payments had been stopped or reduced. 
Around one in five participants <coughs> in both groups reported that this had been the case. Uh, whilst looking at changes in, in hours worked and earnings between wave one and wave two, there was no difference between participants who said their universal credit had stopped or reduced and other participants. What was unclear about that one in five statistic, whether, whether that meant there was the potential for conditionality leading to sanction or benefit with withdrawal. Um, I, I suppose that's a long lead-in, and I apologise for for that. But what concerns um, would witnesses here this morning have if one in five fell foul of, if you like, not the light touch system of conditionality, but the fully fledged system of conditionality and what are the concerns more generally in relation to conditionality for, for those in work receiving universal credit? Um, Mr Finch? Um, so, I think, um, I suppose I'll start a bit where you did with um, who, will, who will the in-work conditionality apply to. And um, you're right, it's, a, it's um, based around earnings. And at the moment, the aim is to basically capture people who aren't earning up to the equivalent of a full-time job at the minimum wage. Um, there's also then exceptions within that if people have things like caring responsibilities. Um, and so, in theory at least, um, the, the work coach and the job centre will be able to, to, to determine um, a kind of suitable amount of work that you should be able to do to fit around your other responsibilities. Um, I think that the trial that DWP have done so far, I think it's, it's very good that they have been testing out this type of support. Um, like you said, the actual, um, the trial itself was quite light touch. They had a kind of range of different types of intervention that ranged from um, a phone call every two months to um, bringing people into the job centre every two weeks, um, which is pretty much in line with the kind of approach you'd get under JSA. Um, I think my, my, general um, expectation of that was that you wouldn't find out a huge amount because it was quite limited in what they were actually testing. Um, what they have found that is that the more intense types of conditionality, so by conditionality I mean um, the expectation that the people will come in every two weeks, not the kind of sanctioning part of it, um, did have a bigger effect on people's earnings. Um, so they were more likely to see a boost to their earnings than um, the group who only had a phone call every every two months. So I think in that sense, it's quite encouraging. And I think um, actually the, the scheme itself does have potential to help support people to increase their earnings. And it's actually the kind of natural progression for the benefit system to take, given um, the kind of how well we're doing on employment and how badly we're doing on low pay. Um, I think the real concern is just exactly how things, how strong that conditionality is and the fact that you're dealing with a very different group of people because these are people who are already in work and so fi them finding time to go to the job centre is going to be very different. So I think, um, I think the r there is a big risk if, if there is um, very strong conditionality applied to the group that this won't work as well as it could do. I think the potential is in finding people that need support and then giving them the right support that they need and doing that potentially in quite an intensive way. Um, I think that the one thing to remember with this trial so far is it's very early days and I think um, potentially the people who are on universal credit were probably, um, they could well have been the harder cases because they're people coming from unemployment into work to be on universal credit in the first place. Whereas in the long term, you will have people who maybe have been in low pay and in work for a longer period of time and so they're already established in the labour market. And I think that's one group that would be really good to kind of focus on in future. Um, I suppose the final... I think the final question around, um, around the in-work conditionality is the extent to which DWP are doing the support or whether other agencies are doing that support. And I think um, the main advantage Universal Credit has is that they, it has the information about people's earnings and so you can find the people who have been stuck in low pay. But then whether or not the job centre is the right um, kind of body to administer that support is, I think, a potentially different question. Um, and it should... I, I would think really it should be working with um, a wider kind of skills body that will help support people to progress. Um, and that, that's partly because not everyone in low pay is going to be on universal credit. So you need the kind of, the two interacting well together. Um, and I think that, but with the universal credit, it is still very early days. Um, the kind of out of work conditionality has taken a couple of decades to get to this stage. So I don't think you can expect to see kind of amazing results overnight with this, but I think it's worth kind of persisting with. Anderson? Yeah, I think... Um, place to start. So the conditionality within universal credit includes, of course, in work requirements. So the onus on the claimant to increase earnings or hours. 
Um, there's also other forms which you could describe as conditionality to so work requirements for those that are out of work. Um, and even the minimum income floor, you can argue, um, is a form of conditionality for those in self-employment. And I think um, you can argue whether any conditionality or not is right. I think where we would be is that you need to have some form of conditionality, even a means test um, would be part of a system. But whether um, the conditions are right to achieve the outcomes that you wish, I think it's the first question. And then secondly, what happens if those conditions are not met? Are the sanctions correct or not? So on that first one, are the conditions right to achieve the outcomes you wish? Um, I think Resolution Foundation have done a lot on this, IPPR have done a lot on this, but career progression has to be, um, to us, the sort of overriding principle, not just within universal credit, but more generally for your interventions into the labour market, because uh, career progression is at the heart of in-work poverty. So if you can drive people up into higher pay or uh, promotions or better terms and conditions, you can begin to tackle some of the um, the economic and social problems that we have. Um, the conditions don't seem to, to us to be particularly focused on that progression. It still seems to be focused as if we're in a, a, a high unemployment uh, scenario context um, and that any job is the aim um, to us. Uh, you know, we have to aim a bit higher than that. Equally, the problems with the conditions as far as we're concerned, conditionality as far as we're concerned, is that it puts the full onus onto the claimant. So the idea that it is the claimant's sole responsibility to increase their hours or increase their earnings um, to the point that it satisfies the universal credit system just bears no relation to reality. You know, it's your employer, it's the economy more generally, as well as the claimant that will have um, an onus, a responsibility to deliver that. And then moving on to the sanctions, are the sanctions right? They seem incredibly extreme as far as we're concerned. So whether they're being applied light touch or not, uh, the possibility of up to, I think, 13 weeks uh, of a sanction after uh, a few sanctions prior to that for not meeting these conditions is, uh, is almost building destitution in as a policy tool, um, which we can see no, you know, whether you're looking at this from an economic point of view or sort of fairness, ethics point of view, we can see no, um, no argument for. Um, our committee has looked at the chance to work to establish uh, why one in five participants in the randomised control trial have had uh, universal credit reduced or ended. There were a variety of reasons for that, of course, but that just jumped out at our initial glance. Uh, Mr Joyce, and then we'll move to other questions from committee members. Just a couple of small things to add to what's already been said. Um, well, I guess in, in, in general, when, I'm, when we're thinking about the extension of conditionality to people in work, which is a really radical moved by the way in some ways I and mean, there's, there's very little if any real precedent for this from other countries which is one of the reasons why the evidence on what kind of effects it might have is, is so sparse and why actually I think these kinds of trials are really welcome it's, it's great that for once um, government is, is trying to, to trial things in a way that allows them to be evaluated and their effects to be to be estimated um, but I guess I'm, I'm thinking of, of, of two things here when I'm thinking about what effects will this conditionality have first of all is it going to bring the benefits that are desired from it which is essentially about um, stimulating more pay progression um, and as I say, we, we basically don't know um, uh, the answer to that question. Um, it's a really key thing <clears throat> for the government to one way or another try be focused on because, as has been mentioned, pay progression is a really, really key issue. A lot of low pay in general is really about a lack of pay progression. So, for example, if you compare the earnings of lower educated versus higher educated people, you tend to find that a lot of the differences come about because of a lack of progression. They end up with much more different earnings than they started with at the start of their careers, and then they diverge thereafter because of a lack of progression. And so a lot of low pay is about a lack of progression. That's a really key issue. But we don't know what effects it's going to have on that. Um, it may well be that to have a big effect on someone's earnings progression and career progression through this kind of means is a very, very resource-intensive exercise, of course. That's, I think, one, uh, one, one point. Um, I guess the other question is... Uh, will it have negative effects that we don't want? So will we, for example, be sanctioning the wrong people? Are there going to be people who are losing out from the sanctioning regime who we don't think should be losing out? Do we think, for example, that the discretion of people in the job centres can, can always adequately distinguish between cases where someone isn't securing higher paying work because 
the, de the labor demand in their area isn't there from cases where they're not trying. You know, that's the kind of the obvious kind of distinction that you might be trying to make, and it's not clear that that will be made perfectly in all cases, and that could lead to people being sanctioned who no one was really intending to be sanctioned. So I think those are the sort of two sides of the coin that, 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 that are key. Um, I haven't had a chance to digest yesterday's report, so particularly given that, I don't think I'm in a position to say much about what the evidence tells me about either of those things at this stage. I think that's fair enough. Uh, yeah. Move to open questions. Uh, Alison Johnson. Thank you very much for your evidence so far. Um, Mr <coughs> Gunson and I actually shared, uh, we, we were on a panel at, uh, in Edinburgh University on Friday working with young researchers who were looking at the need for good evidence to, to inform uh, decision making. And we could perhaps argue that we don't have sufficient evidence at the moment to, to really understand the impacts of in-work conditionality. But I do have a concern that, that this group of people are being used um, as guinea pigs, really, um, in what could be a disastrous experiment. But I'd just like to ask a further couple of questions. You know, this idea of in-work conditionality, I do find it quite hard to get my head round. You know, when is it ever enough? When are people ever making enough effort? Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm entirely unconvinced that this is a sound principle. However, is there a, is there a, is there a possibility? Because it's saying, in very general terms, we're told in our, in our briefing, a person on universal credit can be subject to conditionality if they're earning below a certain threshold. And as we've heard, that's assumed to be 35 hours work at the national minimum wage. I mean, could people work more hours than that simply to you know, to reach this income threshold? Could we be looking at people who are working 60 hours a week in two jobs? I mean, you know, I'm just trying to understand what it is we're trying to achieve here. You know, what are the impacts? So I guess the idea there, the reason for tying it to the minimum wage is, the idea is that as long as the minimum wage is being enforced properly, um, then there's kind of a, there's a, there's a guarantee in a sense that if you're working the, the, that number of hours, you will be, uh, taken out of the conditionality regime. So I guess that's kind of the, that's the logic for tying the, the level below which conditionality applies to some number times the minimum wage. Um, yeah, so, I, I think the, so as long as it's being enforced, um, the minimum wage, um, we wouldn't necessarily see 60 hour weeks as a consequence of in work conditionality. What you may see, though, is whether it's lone parents, whether it's second earners in a household that are working less than full time, um, being, you know, again, if the judgments are in, incorrect at the discretion of DWP or Job Centre Plus, um, being pushed out uh, either to work more hours than is, is suitable for their circumstances or to see a reduction in their entitlement to universal credit. Um, and that, again, you know, as, as Robert was saying, that relies on the discretion, the judgment of of people um, within the system that may or may not be correct. Um, and if it is incorrect, we could be causing a lot of harm, whether that be through either. You know, you could be increasing hours inappropriately, um, and or you could face a cut to your entitlement. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just add, I think that the discretion point is really important. Um, and work coaches are being expected to kind of determine this perfect number of hours for someone with caring responsibilities. And getting that right is going to be really hard. That you, the people will have to know a lot about not just the job market, but they say the childcare market as well to make sure that you're getting um, the right balance there. So I think there is a lot of pressure on um, on advisors for that, and I suppose this is where you have a balance between having a kind of just a set hours rule as you would in the tax credit system, and then trying to provide something more tailored. But then, obviously, it all then depends on how, how good your decision is. Um, I think that I think what is a bit of a shame is that um, this kind of this um, kind of new um, area of kind of reform is is very much coming at a time where we've had such a long period of conditionality getting a bad reputation and being very much tarnished by a kind of heavy sanctioning regime. Um, if you look back to the kind of 2000s, you had things like the um, ERA trials, which were um, employment re retention in advance, I think they stood for. But they were basically an early form of trying this and seeing if you can, you can do things to boost earnings progression. Um, and there is evidence there that um, 
there was one pilot where um, single parents were given a kind of um, time limited payment if they could move in, if they could sustain full time hours. So they got an extra um, payment for a year if they stayed in full time employment for so many months. Um, and that was shown to actually boost the number of um, single parents hitting that that number of hours. Um, but what was very important, so that was the kind of support they got alongside it. So it wasn't just the incentive, it was also the support. But you could, for, you mean, you, that would fall within this kind of, what you would call a conditionality regime, because it's very much, there are conditions attached. So I think um, that seemed to have a positive outcome, um, but came at a, a time where there was less kind of neg negative perception of that type of intervention, I think. Um, so, uh, another question, convener. Um, Mr. Gunson, you, you sort of spoke of the link between the minimum income floor uh, as a, a type of in-work conditionality for, for self-employed people. I mean, it seems um, I'm struck by the idea that you're assumed to have a certain income, whether or not you actually have that income. I mean, how, how can that be workable? It seems to be based on the principle that, um, and maybe this is unfair, but um, that the universal credit system assumes away the complication of claimants um, in order to make it much more, uh, I suppose, not easy but less difficult to run the system. So with self-employment, you know, we had a, a big expansion uh, in self-employment uh, post-crash. It settled down a bit since. Uh, those same people in self-employed employment are now being asked uh, to get themselves up to at least minimum wage, and if not, we'll assume you have it and we'll cut your universal credit accordingly. That just seems completely divorced from their needs. Um, you know, it might help the system to be delivered more easily, but it won't help the claimant in that case, particularly after the whole thrust of policy has been, deliberately or otherwise, to get people into self-employment as an alternative to unemployment. Um, so, yes, I think the minimum income floor, there's a few, so the 12 months, uh, so there's a 12 month transition period before the minimum income floor kicks in. Some people have argued that that should be longer. Um, but the old system, uh, uh, if you like, took the risk of uh, very uh, high fluctuating income or low self-employment income. This one doesn't. This de almost devolves the risk down onto the claimant. Um, is there any hope at all of that being, you know, halted, looked at, revised? There's been certainly, I think, Resolution Foundation have, have made strong representations to government to another CPAG and uh, I think JLF, who you'll hear from in the next panel, likewise. Um, so far, there hasn't been uh, any sign that the UK government are going to move on that. Thank you. Um, okay, Alison, uh, Alison Allen. Thank you, convener. Uh, I'm interested in, in some of what the Resolution Foundation has had to say about the whole issue of incentive for work, because um, obviously one of the claimed um, uh, things that one of the one of the claims that was made originally for for changes to the to the benefit system, uh, and specifically around universal uh, credit, was the idea um, that there would be an increased incentive to work. Um, that at risk of putting words in your mouth doesn't seem to be what you've found. Um, be keen to hear what you have to say about that. So I think um, I mean the big. The big thing here is that when, since universal credit was first introduced, you've had these large cuts to the work allowances, which um, which were announced in uh, the budget in 2015. So they're ve and they're very core to the kind of strength of the incentives within universal credit. So that I think is the one sort of key thing to hold in your mind um, as I start to talk through more of the detail of this. Um, so. Um, I think the one place where, so universal credit introduces something called a work allowance, which means you keep all of your um, benefit income up until a certain level of earnings, whereas in the current system, you'd have had those benefits withdrawn pound for pound. For pound. So there is currently no incentive, really, no financial incentive to kind of work very short hours in the, in the current system. So universal credit improves those incentives. I think that could be good for people like, um, people with quite significant barriers to working more hours. So that might help single parents with very young children or more disabled people. Um, but then as you start to move up the number of hours that people are working, you'll, you start to see the impact of the cuts that have happened. And what that means is that um, essentially you, you will start to get less in work support for some people. Um, at the kind of 16 hour threshold of moving up into full time work. Um, and that creates a kind of weaker incentive for some that it's quite hard to make a kind of a very um, 
broad statement, although we, we do try to make one, but um, because of the kind of complexities of how the support has changed for different types of families. So um, as I think Rob was saying earlier, um, for renters, the overall taper is lower. So some people with a higher amount of rent um, would be keeping potentially more of their support when they get up towards higher hours. Um, but I think it's also the shape of incentive that's very important. And for us, um, the one thing, the two groups we're quite worried about um, are first single parents who start to have the taper applied to their earnings at a relatively low rate, and that's much less generous than it was, sorry, at a relatively low point of their earnings, and that's much lower points in their earnings than it was in the original design of UC. So they'll get to maybe eight to 10 hours and start to have their, um, their benefits withdrawn. And the risk there is that they don't see an incentive to progress beyond that point and get stuck at quite low levels of earnings. Um, I think you would expect them maybe to spread out their earnings a bit, but the kind of the sweet spot of incentive, if you like, is now lower than the 16 hours that was in the tax credit system. And we definitely saw a spike of loan parents around that 16 hours. Um, for second earners, because you see um, it's very much incentivising kind of a person in the household to get into work, um, it's more generous towards a single earning family. Um, so in a couple, that makes the incentive for the second earner to enter work less generous. And they also will see um, around sort of the 63% tape will apply to everything that they earn. So if they move into work, they're standing to lose up to around sort of two thirds of their, their earnings. So they have quite a weak incentive as well. And in a world in which you want to boost people's earnings to potentially tackling work poverty, um, these incentives are going against that. So um, I think overall, um, you can say that um, I think, well, overall, I think that some groups will have gained and some are losing. The kind of the overall shift is probably not that big and certainly not the kind of big gain that you're expecting that would have kind of um, allowed, that would have justified kind of making such a big change to the benefit system. But the real risk is those kind of those groups who you would actually want the benefit system to earn to earn more and are now facing weaker incentives. Is there anything to add to that? Uh, or does that just sum it up? We can let Mr. Allen back in for a further question. Yeah, it's not Mr. Joyce. Short, couple of short points. Yeah. I, one, so I definitely agree with all of that. That's a really good summary, and it is a very mixed picture. I guess one additional thing to add would be that one feature of universal credit, which is a positive one, which has has survived the cuts as well. The reason being it's a kind of fundamental feature of the nature of integrating benefits, which is what UC is doing, is that it does have a pretty strong effect in making incentives a little stronger for the people who under the current system have really, really, really weak incentives. So under the current system, the people who, whose work incentives are incredibly severely weak are people who are subject to the loss of multiple benefits at the same time when they increase their earnings. And because UC replaces multiple benefits with one, those cases do, their incentives do get improved. Um, and I think that is a positive that's worth keeping in mind, but it is also the case that there are many other groups who, who don't have quite such weak incentives now, although still pretty weak in many cases, who actually see things get a little bit worse under UC, and that's why, kind of, you know, on average, uh, there's not much effect overall on work incentives, as, as, as David mentioned. The other point, which was, I think, at least implicit in what David said, but perhaps is worth just bringing out, is that when we're thinking about how incentives are changing for different groups, we probably care more in cases where we know that groups respond to those incentives a lot. Um, so there's a lot of evidence from how people make choices and how that relates to their incentives that groups like single parents and second earners tend to respond more to financial incentives when deciding how much to work. Um, and so, and those are actually both groups who, who do less well out of universal credit in terms of incentives. So that's a reason why we might be a little bit more worried about them. Alan? You mentioned um, uh, in your earlier remarks about the fact that there are large groups of people who appear to be trapped in relatively low wages for, for long periods of time. You, you also, from what you've just said, they're just now describe incentive, in some circumstances, incentive to work. But are we talking here about incentive to work in what may become a situation where they are trapped in, in low pay? And are there any incentives that you could envisage being built into the system which might actually be better at encouraging people to, to, uh, to leave that trap and, and, to, and to, to work in the work, work their way towards better, better paid work. Yeah, I think uh, when it comes to, um, I suppose, the low pay trap 
um, I think that goes beyond universal credit and goes beyond social security, actually. Um, for us, and I think David referred to this earlier, you have to look at your skills system, you have to look at the interventions that you can make um, to the side of whether it be sanctions or, or carrots or sticks through the universal credit system. Um, there is a risk, though, I think, without that, that, as you describe, uh, we are pushing claimants out from either out of work into poor quality work or pushing claimants that are in low hours of poor quality work into higher hours of poor quality work. Um, there's a risk of that. Um, and I, from our point of view, the conditions, the support around claimants for universal credit isn't sufficient to, to sort of allow people to escape from that. These trials we'll see, you know, as it rolls out, we'll see. But there's certainly risks that we see. And the National Audit Office report into the universal credit also identified a good few risks, not just in that regard. But for example, it finds it, um, it finds that the system's very uh, uh, poor at the moment at identifying vulnerable claimants and tracking them and providing them with the support that they need. Um, that may include some of these uh, loan parents and second earners that we wish to see um, incentives for. Last thing, it's almost maybe referring to your previous question, but work incentives are one thing, of course, and they're very important, and it's a huge part of in-work poverty, but the levels of support are also very important. So whilst work incentives may or may not have been improved, and you've heard the complicated picture, what we do know is that for lots of people in the universal credit system, they'll be receiving less than under the previous system, despite working. Um, so work incentives, are, uh, just to be clear, uh, of course, different from the amount of support that people receive. Just, I think Mr. Joyce wanted to come in, and then we'll move to the next question. You, you didn't, Mr. Joyce? You okay? I'll just, I'll just make one more. I suppose. I mean, in general, it's worth noting there is there is something of a trade-off between, so for a given budget, for a given amount of spending you're going to do on universal credit or any other means-tested benefit, there's going to tend to be a trade-off between focusing on encouraging people to do some work rather than none and focusing on, once they're in work, encouraging them to do more. Because, you know, if you think of it, it's a set amount of money. Um, if you allow people to keep hold of more of that when they start doing some work, uh, then for a set amount of money, you're going to have to withdraw it more aggressively from other people higher up the earning distribution when they're doing more work and, and vice versa. So you know, there is in general a trade-off there. Um, it is the case that the, the problem we have in general with poverty now is more about a lack of pay progression and less about a lack of employment. Um, nevertheless, if you if you want to sort of to, to change the structure of universal credit such as so as to to focus more on encouraging progression, there would still be a risk that you would therefore discourage employment for a given budget, unless you're willing to spend more. Okay, yeah, let's start. Uh, Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Shona Robertson. Um, thank you, Commissioner. Um, just a couple of questions. I, I was interested in the opening statement in, um, by Mr. Gunson about the rollout of it. Um, just before the summer recess, this committee took evidence um, from Highland Islands Council, who were very positive about the rollout and how it was working. And because they had done the appropriate work, then they were saying actually there was very little problem with the transfer happening. And certainly, again, having spoken um, to Musselburgh, which was one of the trial early trial pilots and having visited them on a couple of occasions, they too haven't raised these issues. So I'm just wondering where this evidence is coming from um, and why is it working in highlands and islands and maybe not working in other parts? And is it down to more to do with the administration of the local authority rather than necessarily the concept? And the second question, and this may be more aimed at Mr Joyce or anyone else can jump in. Um, I, I've been trying to know about people who are self-employed because obviously their um, income can vary dramatically from one week, one month, even one year. Um, will they be affected negatively or differently from those who are in employment? Um, and do we need to kind of treat them differently from those who have maybe a permanent 36 hour a week job? On the rollout, um, so bearing in mind the client group that currently has been rolled out, so it's Predominantly, as uh, David was saying, longer term, but also fewer children, fewer families uh, in the client group so far. Uh, that will change as we progress with the rollout. 
The second thing is there is evidence not from IPPR Scotland directly, but through Trussell Trust and Food Bank Use, through housing associations and rent arrears, um, through more reported from claimants themselves, um, financial difficulties. There is evidence to suggest that where UC has been rolled out, the indicators don't point in a positive direction. But I think you're also right to suggest that that will vary on how it is rolled out. So there will be people, um, you know, some of that is structural, some of that is the change in amounts, and you've heard some of this evidence already, but some of that will be about how it's implemented. So you're right to suggest that, um, and I think this is happening, but uh, DWP needs to learn from where it's rolled out relatively smoothly and where it hasn't, uh, particularly over this next, well, four-year period as it rolls out um, uh, fully. Um, in terms of self-employment, I, I will leave Robert and David to talk more about it, but um, in terms of self-employment, they are treated, those that are self-employed claimants are treated slightly differently from those that are in work themselves. Um, one of the key things, so we mentioned already the minimum income floor and the, the quite short 12-month transition, you know, imagine setting up a business um, and within 12 months being asked to at least get to full-time minimum wage profits. That's quite a tall order. But beyond that, there's also how the income or profits is counted. So um, whereas for tax purposes, and again, I think Resolution have, have done a lot on this, tax purposes, it's an annual return on your profits. For universal credit, it's a month to month, um, which doesn't seem um, too, uh, I suppose it doesn't seem too flexible to that uh, cohort. I'll leave Robert and David to talk more. Yeah. Of employment aspect of it, uh, rather than the local authority um, and the rollout stuff. David Finch, do you want to? Sure. Um, I will. I will very quickly pick up on the rollout part, which I think is. Um, it, it's actually. It's just very hard to know how how badly or how well people are being affected by the kind of the practical administration of UC as it's coming out. I think a lot of the very bad stories are from much earlier parts of parts of the implementation where they literally didn't really have a full IT system built um, and things were going um, and and they've had they had problems in that initial kind of IT system design and since then they've shift, shifted to a new IT system um, there are still some issues with that and that still isn't fully built but the, the kind of the rate at which they're getting um, people's first claims paid in full and on time has improved it was it was around the kind of 50 60 percent um, so half people weren't getting paid in full on time and now that's up to about 80 percent there hasn't been a big improvement from that 80 percent so far and some of that is about um, the additional information that the system needs to process the claim so maybe your housing costs or your childcare costs um, and again something that russell's mentioned is you see very much makes its own system simple but puts all the burden of finding information on the on the person on the claimant and so i think that's partly why it's hard for people to get that, the right information to the system to get their claim processed on time so i think there's definitely um there's room for improvement there but it has improved and i think there are signs that um the core of what is now uc of the ucit system has improved and is improving over time so i think that's hopefully we will see less of those problems as we go forwards. Um, and that's quite, um, that is quite important because there's being a kind of, there's a very negative perception, so, perception associated with universal credit. And actually so the, one, the one gain that you still get from it is this gain in take up um, where people will get more of their benefits by claiming. And if people are put off by the negative perception, um, that could start to move in the other direction. So I think there is something about trying to find the positives in universal credit. And also, um, and that's partly on DWP to make that more um, public as to what is actually happening. Um, sorry, that wasn't quick, was it? Um, the, on self-employment, uh, over to Mr Joyce for self-employment yeah. and, and yeah. that, that will give other, can... other members a chance to get in and ask a question. I sure. apologise, Mr That's Mr right. Joyce, self-employment. On this one. Uh, anyway, so, yeah, I, I mean, I think, so there is a, there is a serious um, uh, aspect to, to, to how the minimum income floor for the self-employed affects those with volatile incomes within the year. And, of course, in self-employment, that's, that's pretty common to have you know, not to have a constant stream of income or indeed expenses through the year. Um, so basically what, what can happen is that uh, if, you, if you take a, an extreme example to make it really easy to see, if, if, if you get all of your income in one month, uh, then uh, you uh, in that month are entitled to no universal credit. In the other months, though, you, you have no income. Um, and so, but because of the minimum income floor, you still don't get 
if it, you either get very little universal credit or still or, or still nothing. Um, whereas if that income had been spread evenly through the year, you, you may well have been entitled to uh, a bit of universal credit throughout the year. And so you can have people, you know, it's not just a self-employed versus non-self-employed issue, it's also a volatile self-employed income versus non-volatile self-employed income issue. If you compare those two cases, you can have people who over the year make the same earnings, um, but one of them can get a lot more universal credit than, than the other. Um, and so th that is a pretty big discrepancy. Um, one thing uh, that it seems to me could in principle be done, I still haven't heard of a, a, a good reason why the Department of Work and Pensions couldn't do this, is to decide whether to apply the minimum income floor based on your last, your previous 12 months of earnings um, rather than just the current snapshot, um, which would help to ameliorate that, that problem. Uh, but at the, at the, at the moment, it, it seems to, to think that that's, uh, well, it seems to suggest that's infeasible. I can't see why. But, um, but that's, that is a, a big issue in terms of discrepancy between how volatile incomes are treated and how non-volatile incomes are treated uh, for the self-employed. Mr. Bell. I just wanted to pick up something that was mentioned earlier about the discretion of work coaches and um, your understanding and what evidence and assessment you has been made around uh, how that works in practice. So discretion of itself is not necessarily a bad thing, but it could be if it's applied unfairly. Um, is there any evidence of a particular geographical variation, for example, in um, the application of that discretion? Um, what is there guidance that work coaches are working to to, um, to, to try to, to keep some kind of consistency? Because I guess I would be concerned that there are very subjective decisions, therefore, being made in individual cases that could vary widely depending on the discussion of work coaches. So I'm interested in just a bit more on what uh, your under what evidence is being gathered, what your understanding is, and whether or not there's that variation being picked up. Yeah, I mean, I think it, this is probably a, a quicker answer. That, that I don't think there is any great evidence to show um, that kind of variation at the moment. Um, I think. What is worth um, thinking about is that the role of the work coach is much expanded beyond what's currently expected of um, the, the traditional Job Centre Plus advisor. And there is a lot more information that they need to be able to understand and apply appropriately. Um, there's, there is, DWP have a kind of um, training scheme essentially to, to make sure people are, they go through it and they have a kind of qualification to say that they have you know that they are at work coach status um but i think there is still a huge burden on them and the pay isn't like exceptional for what's expected of them particularly when you think if the decision goes wrong then um it's going to have a really big impact on someone's life um so i think i guess essentially it would be good to see some more um detailed information on how that's being applied um the, the kind of anecdotal stuff you hear is that it's not actually those difficult decisions about how many hours they think someone should be working that they get wrong. Sometimes things like is someone self-employed or not is, is, is being got wrong as well. Um, well, that's very much the kind of anecdotal things you hear through um, the kind of uh, child poverty action group um, cases where errors have occurred. I'd only add to, to back up, there's very little evidence just now and National Audit Office uh, report would suggest that we may never know uh, in many respects how universal credit is performing and I think this is one of those you know how would we be able to tell maybe comparing across local authorities but even then the economies are very different uh, in some respects how would we know whether those decisions are being gotten right or not um, and I'm not clear that we you know that DWP has the uh, the processes in place to allow us to know that in the future. So you would certainly recommend they should have, presumably, and they should be gathering that as part of the, the rollout process? Yeah, as best as possible. And uh, the, other, the only very brief thing to add is that as well as uh, relatively low pay, as well as a huge demand in terms of the sort of breadth of the role, there'll be a huge demand in terms of the numbers of, of claimants per coach in the future. Hundreds, I think. Um, so uh, it looks a big risk, particularly given... Uh, as we just discussed, the in-work conditionality aspects. Okay. Okay. Anything else, Shona? No, that's okay. fine. Michelle Ballantyne. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I want to talk a bit about um, fluctuating income levels and how people are affected, obviously, with universal credit calculating in arrears on a monthly basis. And DWP have said it's really the individual's responsibility to budget. So I, I just would like to sort of ask your view on that. And obviously, with the thresholds changing as well in terms of surplus income, what your view on that is and you know where, where, how you think it affects people and what from each of your organizations what your view is on how you see should handle that whole element of, of budgeting and fluctuating incomes and thresholds mm -hmm. it, it seems to be blunt not good enough to suggest that people on the lowest incomes fluctuating incomes potentially insecure work whether self-employed or otherwise, it's not good enough to suggest that they need to just budget better. Um, and uh, we know that this, well, certainly has been a, at least a temporary uh, trend in the economy over the last 10 years, and it could be with automation, with lots of changes that we see coming our way, a bigger part of the economy. So to have uh, you know, primary out of in and in work poverty benefits or social security payments that can't really handle fluctuating incomes very well seems to me to be a, an absolute um, miss. Um, what should they do? I think um, you know. I think it's two and a half thousand pounds just now in terms of uh, before you start to carry over the income to the future months. That's reduced into three hundred pounds. I think that seems awfully low. Um, and that, uh, that uh, and we've discussed self-employment um, too in terms of the minimum income floor and whether you do that month to month or whether you do that over 12 months. Um, that's tweaking. I think those tweaks would be important, but more fundamentally, I think you need a universal credit system that can much better handle fluctuating incomes and self-employment because this may be a part of our labour market that's here to stay. Given that comment, what would be your solution then and in terms of it because everybody kind of says that but I suppose it's more about okay so what should we do then well I, I, so we touched on some of those things so um, you know the minimum income floor in and of itself is that even the right principle to have why not as uh, David was saying base it on last year's earnings that's one um, discussed there the idea of um, having a much higher threshold before you carry over which again would even out fluctuation in incomes that's another the, the annual rather than monthly um, self-employment check of income is another. Um, beyond that, I think... Oh, sorry. Not just to self-employ the supplies, to yes. employed people as well. Yes. So are you looking for parity across those two things? I think it's, it's more to do with being able to iron out those fluctuations. And uh, to be honest, the, you know, the trade-off here is that you will be paying out benefits to people through universal credit that um, may be having a good month in the inverted commas or a good quarter. But the, the trade-off is if you don't do that, you'll be not paying benefits to people that desperately need them. And again, building in destitution into the system as a design. So um, I hope that's clear in terms of some of the things that we could do. Um, and beyond that, uh, again, the direction of travel has to be about catering to that cohort in a much better way than UC does just now. Um, yeah, so I think um, I think there's there's a few things within that question. I'll try and do them quickly. Um, I think um, there, I think in in principle, potentially universal credit could actually smooth someone's income out month to month because you have your month of earnings and then you get your payment three or four days later if everything's going nice and smoothly, um, and that will have reflect what you weren't in the previous period. So actually, that could actually smooth things. Um, what is the, the potential problem there is that people may not be able to understand what that amount will be, and it's a change that the current system where you just get paid a kind of flat monthly payment, which at least, you, if you know what the money is, you can try and budget around that, because you'll also know what you've earned. Um, I think actually UC can support some people with fluctuating earnings, because um, if you're taking earnings over a month, then if you have different amounts of work week to week, it's actually, it is already doing some averaging within that, so it does smooth a little bit. Um, I think the big picture thing here is that um, in the, Universal Credit is going at one end of the spectrum where it's assessing income on a monthly basis and trying to get that payment accurate to that amount of income, whereas the tax credit system went in completely the other direction and tried to ignore any change in circumstance at all because it couldn't handle, because it simply couldn't handle them. Um, so you had the big disregards and income change. So really you're, you're, what you're trying to get to is a trade-off between do you um, have some form of averaging 
and or against having a more timely system. Um, I think you know, where you go with that, you could have a three-monthly system, but you're always going to have a trade-off between either you're spending more out in ben the benefits will be inaccurate, and that might lead to over and under payments, which, um, you know, that doesn't really get reflected when you talk about universal credit, but that causes a lot of hassle for people as well, so you probably want to avoid that. Um, but then when you have a very tight monthly assessment period, because of the way in which the earnings come in are counted within that month, it's when they're actually paid to you rather than where you may think the, the month of work that that income actually applies to, um, that causes people to potentially move out of the system. So you could get two pay packets in one month, and that means you've earned so much that you've moved out of the system altogether. So you could go to an actual, an actual average of your earnings over the period for the work you did, but then how are you going to measure that? So there's, there are lots of trade-offs there, and I'm not offering a great solution to it. Um, I think the, the surplus earnings thing is, again, it's, it's a very specific, complicated rule. I don't know anyone um, from some of the kind of accountants that do the um, that look in like the low-income tax reform group, or I think very much understand all the technical detail. They think it's far too complicated. Um, I don't think anyone really understands them. But I, from from what I understand, the purpose of it is to stop people colluding with employers so that they get paid in periods to maximise their UC. I mean, the likelihood of that happening, I think, is quite slim. And if, you, if you're worried about that, then you can probably do it through um, kind of enforcement arrangements elsewhere, where you actually target employers who are suddenly um, coming out with odd pay arrangements, rather than sort of doing this very complicated workaround on top of UC. Um, and it's very much for people who you think might be moving out of UC. And I think the real risk there is um, if they lower the threshold back to, um, I can't remember, the £300, then you could have someone that takes on some seasonal work um, their earnings are counted against their UC for the next six months, though they're not getting any, then they drop out of work and get no income at all. And I think that's not really, I don't think, the incentive you want to create. Um, and I would just suggest that they're, they're scrapped entirely, essentially. I don't think there's a kind of... They're really complicated and they potentially create some perverse incentives. Um, yeah. Yes, there's something about the other end of it, about maybe you said at the beginning um, of your introductions that we couldn't look at a lot of this in isolation, that we needed to look at it in terms of the job market, in terms of the economy as a whole. And maybe there's something at the other end about the rules about how you pay people, whether we have a fixed day for paying people so that it aligns with how we also do benefits. Um, I mean, I think... I suppose it's the extent to which um, I think UC is trying to mirror the world of work, as it says, um, and I suppose it's hard to see the number of people in universal credit probably doesn't justify all employers moving. Um, so I would think really it's for DWP to move a bit, I think. Um, and I do think this is something that will eventually, as more people get on the system and you have many more working families on the system, they will have to move on it in some way. Um, the DWP to move the pay date of UC to match the pay date of somebody's employment. So if it's the last Friday of the month or the last day of the month. Have you had those conversations? Um, so I think mm -hmm. the, at the moment you get a set entitlement period from the day you claim. So, and I think what DWP probably don't want is that if everyone's paid at the end of the month, everyone claims at that point so that they get the same assessment period because it just means lots of people claiming on the same day, essentially. Um, I think the problem, though, is that even if you have a set pay day, your employer probably doesn't always pay you on that day because you have things like bank holidays, they just get the payroll wrong, um, or you're paid, um, you might be paid for something in arrears for some reason. So it's just very hard to get that perfect. So I think you probably end up somewhere in the world of averaging things out, um, but your trade-off then will be inaccuracy. Come back again, yeah. basically. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. 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 I'm going to let, let you in briefly before we move to George Adam uh, for the next question. But can, can I just check? Is, is what witness he's saying is that some of this has to change? Russell Gunston suggested a number of ways some of the, these matters could change. Mr. Finch said maybe just stop some of it altogether. But just Mr. Joyce, it would be quite good if we get a kind of unanimity or otherwise amongst the panel. Some of the elder questions Michelle Ballantyne was raising. Does the system have to change and take account of some of the suggestions that Mr Gunston was making and Mr Finch indeed said just scrap some of that uh, you know, income floor? I find it hard to be totally categorical because I don't, and not being a sort of tax administration expert, I don't really know, I don't feel too confident knowing exactly how severe these concerns are that the government clearly has about 
manipulation of the timing of earnings and, or, and, and whether there are better ways of trying to uh, get at that than what the government is proposing. I definitely think that the surplus earnings rules in trying to tackle that problem are clearly having um, uh, negative effects as a side effect. So there's, at the very least, there's a, there's a trade-off here. I, I mean, I think uh, the way I think about this is that, that basically, in general, the government's always have, having to make a choice between is it trying to alleviate short-term hardship which points to having short assessment periods, or is it trying to focus resources on people who kind of in a, in a longer run sense are the worst off, which points towards having longer assessment periods. And under the previous system we had for the out of work benefits, which are basically the safety net benefits, it took the former approach, which you might think makes sense. These are, these are there to alleviate short term hardship, had short assessment periods. And for tax credits, we took the other approach where we had longer assessment periods. Under UC, it's had to unify those rules and it's chosen a shorter assessment period. But then it started worrying for some of these in-work claimants about the possibility then of manipulation um, of the timing of income. And as a sort of fudge to try to deal with that, it's brought in these surplus earnings rules, which effectively move you back towards something closer to an annual assessment period or a six-monthly one. But by doing that, because that's then affecting all UC claimants, not just the equivalent of the old tax credit claimant, it's affecting the out-of-work safety net too, then you get these situations where someone can be earning a decent income, but perhaps expecting to continue doing that, spending it, not making provisions, and you might not think totally unreasonably, they just then suffer a big shock, they fall out of work, and they have to wait quite a while to get UC because of these surplus earnings rules. Um, and that seems like a pretty severe characteristic for a so-called safety net to have, where you have to wait a long time when you suffer a big shock like that. Um, so I, I don't have a magic answer. I think the key question I would want to know more on is how much more can the government do to try to distinguish the kind of genuine manipulation that it's worried about from other cases, and also how, how important anyway is that genuine manipulation? How common actually is that, as David was, was pointing to? In some ways, bring in local discretion, but that's back to Shona's point around how do we manage that local discretion. Okay. Thank you. George Adam. Good morning. I would just want to ask, it's, it's about fluctuating uh, in self-employed, uh, incomes and self-employed again. Basically, if you're, uh, as David Finch already said, universal credit's meant to mirror the world of work. But if you're a self-employed person and over the year you get by you get by, but you manage to get by. But there are peaks and troughs all the way. I know because I come from a self-employed family. You know, so if that happens over that period, then surely it's a disincentive to the individuals to get involved in the system because you've got to report monthly as opposed to annually under the previous system. So effectively, you're sitting there month after month, another kind of burden on you, you're getting on with your business, dealing with your family life, and at the same time, you've got universal credits or DWP, the dark cloud over your shoulder, and you don't know if it's actually going to, you're going to have the support there that you need that might put bread on the table. Surely that's a disincentive to self-employed people. Well, yeah, I suppose in uh, in theory it could be. So if you um, if you are having to interact on the benefit system in a way that you're not used to as a self-employed person, um, then of course that might add red tape and disincentivise you to get the support that you need. I think the thing to bear in mind when it comes to self-employed um, work these days. So I think IFS have done uh, a good amount of work on it is that a lot of the self-employment that we see in the economy across the UK is very low paid. So I think it's 4% of self-employed people earn more than £40,000. And the average is profits have dropped from about 15000 to about 12000 um, between 07 and 12. Uh, sorry, 2007 and 2012. So these are self-employed in name, but actually they are in many ways low income low pay, the distinction between self-employment and insecure work, for example, is, is quite blurry at points, if not legally, in terms of the experience. So I suppose, what do we do about it? So if it is a disincentive, um, then what we need to do is make sure that we've got, firstly, all the, the outreach support that can be Scottish Government as much as UK Government to say, you know, there are benefits here, you need to claim them if you need them. Um, and we've, I won't repeat, but we've touched on some of the things that you could do to reduce um, the red tape for self-employed people, but also improve the system for self-employed people too. Mr. Joyce, no, nope. do you want to follow up on that, George? Well, mainly on the point of the one to, report. Thing, uh, to me, 
that seems like the, the major issue and the major problem over everything. You know, the, the whole of universal credits, uh, whether it's uh, the, you're working in a normal job and the monthly reporting, especially if you're working in a job where uh, you actually your your salary fluctuates as well, you know, and you could be in a low income, but you could have a couple of good months in between because of bonuses and everything else, or overtime and things like that. So the, these are the kind of things that I'm saying. The monthly reporting seems to me to be the complete madness of the whole situation. There must be a better way of actually doing that, which would be longer term. So the the red tape argument, but the the previous question. The response there was not just red tape, but also um, around that fluctuation in income. So if tax is calculated on an annual basis, then shouldn't we move to an annual basis for self-employed people through universal credit? Mr Russell, is we've got a Tory government that says it's going to cut red tape that just keeps creating more red tape. Is that what you're saying? Or am I paraphrasing you? I couldn't possibly comment on that. But, uh... You get allowed to address the point if you want, Mr Gunson. There. Okay. <laughs> any further questions, Mr. Adam? Okay. Uh, well, that was the, that, that's the end of this particular session. That was the first cut at, at, at this, this new inquiry. We thank all three of you for your time. We'll shortly be going to another another panel, but can we suspend briefly for a moment? Thank you very much. Who have, who have had a comfort break that we've had to start again because of time constraints. Um, so my apologies for that. But can I welcome the next set of witnesses? Uh, Deborah Hayes, Scotland Policy Officer, Joseph Rowntree Foundation, and Polly Jones, Project Manager, a menu for change, Oxfam Scotland. Thank you both of you. Thank you for your patience in waiting there during that last evidence session. I will move straight to questions. I will move to our Deputy Convener, Polly McNeill. Uh, good morning. Um, I'd like to ask you some questions about um, your excellent paper, and I'm interested in the changes to the design of universal credit means more children will end up in poverty. Um, I think uh, it would be helpful to have more information about that transition 
for families who were in receipt of working families tax credit and child tax credit. We know that those particular tax credits have lifted literally thousands of children out of poverty. And it would be a tragedy if the transition into universal credit means that we're going to lose that progress that was made. And obviously this committee were instrumental in the Child Poverty Act. And there's a few things in that um, that, that, that has been highlighted, for example, um, the, the issue of single parents and the tendency for them to be in poverty. Could I just draw the committee's attention uh, for the record to a couple of things that I thought was interesting that I was unaware of. Um, in your paper, you say there's extremely slow growth in men's pay levels over the last two de decades. On the other hand, faster growth in female earnings drive to large increases in the rates of employment paid amongst um, women. I thought that was an interesting point in the paper. But I'm really interested in an answer of uh, anything that can guide the committee about the impact of universal credit on child tax credit and families tax credit. Um, thank you. Um, so yes, as some of the evidence you've heard and is in the written submission, we are worried about certain groups moving into universal credit. As you've heard from the previous witnesses, at the moment most of the move on to universal credit has been for single households without children. There's been quite a, mod quite a lot of modelling that's been done to look at what the differences in universal credit are. And those differences come on top of um, a, other changes, for example, the benefit freeze and so on. So you've got those changes being grafted onto what has already been a, a difficult transition for the last couple of years. So um, as the previous witnesses said, the, the big challenge are for certain kinds of household types, particularly with as you say, children, so families. Lone parent families and couples where only one works are particularly at risk of poverty. So JRF has been doing some work recently and we'll be publishing a report um, in October. And I think what is emerging out of that evidence, though obviously it isn't out yet, is um, that those are very significant parts of the groups of households who are in, who are in poverty and many of them are working. Um, you'll know that the organisational position is that work allowances are key to that. So if we could restore work allowances to the original design of universal credit, you would enable those hard-pressed families to keep more of what they earn. And in effect, that would help. That would help enormously. We've done a lot of modelling to suggest that that's the single most important thing that could change the prospects for those families. One of the figures that you've given the committee is that um, a lone parent with two children working 16 hours, that average housing costs with no childcare costs would be 11% worse off. Um, there are other figures you've given us where there's no childcare, two children, 4% weren't off. That modelling that you talked about of the, the, work, the working allowance, uh, would those figures disappear or would they still show that there would be a reduction? If you improve the work allowances, yeah, no, they, it makes an enormous difference improving the work allowance um, in both of those circumstances. I can provide additional modelling after the committee if there are particular things that, that you want to talk about. Um, JRF is full of very brainy economists and modellers, and unfortunately I'm not one of those. Um, so I know most of the headlines, but a lot of the detail would probably be best given to you by um, the analysts who do that work. So if you've got specific questions, I'd be very happy to follow them up. I don't know if you can answer this, but in the transition for families that are in receipt of um, child tax credit, at the moment, how does that transition over into universal credit? What is the calculator for that? How are we getting to those figures where some families that is 11% worse off? Are you able to answer that? Um, so most of those families will be moved over in managed migration. It's new claims. Um, that will be first touched by universal credit when it's, when it's rolled out. And there's a process up to 2023 to moving all of the people who are currently on what's called the legacy benefits over into to UC. And obviously there's some concerns about, about that. So people who are in, only in receipt of working tax credits or child tax credits, uh, unless they're in a full service area, they're not currently on the system. Is that your understanding mm. also? Yeah. And I, th I think that relates to a question that was asked earlier about how is it that the Highland and Islands councils were reporting that everything had been fine. Um, many for changes working um, on the ground across areas of Scotland, looking really at the working with people who are turning to food banks who have no money left for food. 
for food. So our information about universal credit is really about that very lowest income group and what their, their experiences have been. But in, our, in undertaking that work, we've uh, been in contact with a lot of councils who are at different stages of experiencing universal credit uh, rollout, full service rollout. And although others have also reported that things have gone slightly better than maybe they were expecting, the, the big concern is what happens with the um, managed migration for the many more complex cases, individuals who are in receipt of exactly the, the kind of um, credits that you talk about when they are forcibly moved onto the universal credit system and how that interacts because so far the majority of people who um, are on universal credit have, are, are individuals or with much more straightforward experiences. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, move to open questions from committee members. Alice Mallon. Alison Johnson. Thank you, Convener. Um, I think uh, both of your submissions have picked up on, on the, the fact that most, 64% of adults in poverty now live in working households, um, which seems directly at odds with the, the intention, um, with the much repeated rhetoric that we hear from the United Government, that the United Kingdom Government, that the best way out of poverty is to be in work. So clearly, <coughs> something is going horribly wrong. Now, I know a lot of that. We, we, it, it, I'm just kind of wanting to get the fact, you know, is, is universal credit the best benefit for people who are in work? Or should we be looking at something entirely different? Because the, I, I'm not a fan of the word worklessness, <laughs> um, which is uh, used in, in, in the information that we have today. But we're getting more people into work, but they're still being paid too little, even with universal credit, to maintain you know, the kind of life that we would want to see people enjoying. Do we have to look again at how this benefit is designed for those who are in work in particular? OK, so they're, they're sort of currently... They're, as you say, the, the majority experience of poverty now is, is from households who are in work. Um, Universal Credit is trying to provide a top-up to that. So um, my own organisation um, originally was... a was supportive of the idea of a simplified system that was able to better respond to a whole host of, of different um, circumstances. Um, the challenge, I guess, is whether the system as it's currently configured is doing enough to support the different kinds of families and the different kinds of constraints. So what is behind the um, large prevalence of working poor are, as you say, low pay levels, um, insecure um, employment, sort of cycling in and out of, of some temporary work. Um, as the other witnesses have said, um, there are lots of issues about people getting into a any job but not being able to progress onto a better job. Um, and those issues probably require, uh, I think as some of the other witnesses have said, a wider response across the system, the skills system, the transport system, the housing system, childcare, to actually be able to encourage families and, and create an environment for families where they can move on and they can improve their prospects. Um, the work allowance is important because where families are working, um, it enables them to keep a little bit more of what they earn in order to, in order to progress. Um, so a simplified system as universal credit is trying to be is is fine in theory um, but it needs to be able to respond to the different constraints for different kinds of households so lone parents when only one parent is working they do struggle to balance work and caring uh, in in a way that enables them to earn enough to to work their way out of poverty to a uh, two couple family where both of them both parents work part time again are very very vulnerable to high levels of in work poverty so we need to address we need to make sure that both wages and our strategies and policies around wage levels and work with employers and skills actually do at least as much of the heavy lifting as a social security. So you actually need both of those systems to be able to talk to each other and be able to respond to the real life circumstances in which different kinds of families are found. Just to, to add a little bit more about um, our experience of universal credit and the rollout so far. Um, I don't think it can be said often enough that uh, 
evidence from the Trussell Trust, you all know a, a, a UK-wide network of uh, food banks, found that in areas of uh, universal credit full service over a 12-month period, there was a 52% increase in the number of people who were turning to food banks. Now, that has to tell you that something is going wrong with the system when that many people can't feed themselves or their families. 52% increase. Um, and... Uh, I think it would be it would be worth discussing a bit more with the committee about um, and expanding on what was what was touched on earlier, not just about low pay, but about the quality of work that people, um, the kind of jobs that people are doing, who are earning those very lowest levels. Um, we have um, many many testimonies and interviews from our research of people who are on temporary contracts. And if you're on a temporary contract, we've talked about people who are self-employed, but if you're on a temporary contract, the universal credit system is not, is not delivering at the moment. You come in and out of work and, and, and your un universal credit, um, uh, um, the amount that comes just does not reflect and does not see you through the gaps in, your, in, in the contracts that, that you would have. And we've got... Um, there's some interesting cases. Most of our work is in Dundee and in East Ayrshire and in Fife, where there are big local employers who are well known for um, using temporary contracts um, all of the time. And, and that has left many people's um, families without money for, for weeks on end while they're claim, because their claim has been stopped. They've peaked at the amount that they earned in one assessment period and then they, their, their claim is closed. They've got to reapply and then they've got an inbuilt waiting period before they, before they get any more money. And it's in that period we find them turning to, to emergency food aid supplies just to try and make ends meet. To what extent have these policies been, this particular policy, universal credit, been equality impact assessed? Because it certainly seems to be hitting certain groups far harder than others. Um, clearly, there are winners and losers, but there seem to be a lot of losers here, and they, they do seem to be quite focused. Yeah, I think there have there have been a number of quite strong submissions to the UK government about about the impact analysis, particularly on women, people with long term ill health and and disabilities, um, and that partly reflects women's gendered experience in the labour market. So it's a it's an intersection between um, that equality issue and um, as Polly was talking about the quality of work that people at the the lower end of the income distribution tend to be tend to be um, exposed to. Um, I imagine that it's probably for the UK government to talk about the extent to which it has impact, quality impact assessed its own work, but certainly I'm aware that there have been quite strong representations to it. I'm, I'm happy to ask questions, but I'm looking at committee members who would like to come in at this point. Okay, commit. Yeah, Shona Robinson. The it says here that six percent of workers are on temporary contracts. Um, I think that was uh, Oxfam's um, evidence. It would be helpful if you have some more detailed evidence, um, not necessarily here today, but as a follow-up of um, whether there are quite wide geographical variations there, and also. Well, as I suspect, we would um, assume that you've just been talking about uh, the gender differentials, that um, there would be a higher percentage of women on those temporary contracts or not. It would be helpful to follow up with a little bit of the detail of any geographical variation, gender variation, and evidence that you have around the impact of um, that group uh, of the, the rollout of universal credit, just because I am aware of some of the, certainly from my own uh, mailbag around some of the Dundee issues, um, but it would be helpful if we could get some more concrete evidence around around that. Um, I mean, from our, our the, the, the data we've got from the three areas that we've been working in is actually very consistent about um, who who is who is turning who is turning up at um, a food bank with or ha is presenting at a job centre with with no money for food, um, and who has uh, temporary insecure work? Um, a, a lot of men actually. People talk about their partners and their uh, brothers. Um, and maybe that's because they're the ones. If we relate it to the evidence we heard earlier, that are the main the main earners and the women with often are having the caring responsibilities and become the second earners. And certainly we've got a lot of data suggesting that 
um, lone mothers, single or sing, single mums are very concerned about uh, the expectation of them to be taking on more hours and the anxiety that causes when it's them left to navigate how they um, the kind of work they take on and the childcare system just as we touched on before in the earlier session that you need a system that um, understands how all of these different areas interrelate actually the experience of people that we've been working with across Scotland is that it's the system's not sorting that out they're having to navigate that and making quite sophisticated choices about how they can manage to to get this child in, in uh, looked after at this time to pick up this temporary contract and then weave, weave it all together in quite a complex arrangement that at the end maybe doesn't even doesn't even add up in the in terms of the numbers that people have to um, manage their accounts at the end. Certainly, okay. Jerry, I've got some evidence, I think, to support some of that about who ends up in destitution and what some of those those triggers are. It doesn't relate necessarily to temporary contracts, but but that's one element of, of that sort of shock that can um, plunge people into destitution. So be, be happy to share that. Um, some of the gender data isn't as isn't as disaggregated to local area as we might like. So some of that stuff is quite difficult, but I know our analyst colleagues have done some of that work, so we're certainly happy to share that with you. Yeah, I'll follow up on a little bit of this, George, and I'll, I'll, I'll take you in next. I was just going to make the observation, when, when my local job centre in, in Mary Hill closed, one of the, the groups most impacted by it were uh, lone parents, uh, most, most, mostly single mums. Uh, and two things emerged from that. One, actually, some of them had built up a, a reasonable, positive relationship with their, their, their work coach. And actually, because they were maybe changing, that relationship was destroyed a bit. But basic things about can they get a bus to get at their job centre on time, genuine concerns in relation to that. Now, that's just to go to a job centre. That's not to get to a paid employment for 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. in the morning. Um, so some, some of the barriers that my constituents would face out of work getting into work or actually being able to top up their hours in work are fairly basic things such as access to workable childcare solutions, public transport infrastructure and the, the affordability of work. Now, given the fact that universal credit uh, was supposed to tackle in-work poverty and give people pathways in career progression, and you're obviously saying that there's, there's uh, genderised issues in, in, in relation to that. Is there anything that Universal Credit is doing that addresses that in a positive way? I could sit here and ask all the negative questions, right? And I'm happy to do that. But is there anything that Universal Credit is doing in a positive fashion to deal with some of those barriers to work in the first place and then to making work pay for some of the most vulnerable people in my constituency? That the operation of universal credit has some of those things in its ambit, but you're absolutely right that I suppose taking a, a more positive look at this, the sort of things that help people progress are um, dedicated ad um, advice and financial planning, um, which they may or may not be supported to do through their job centre and other, other providers in the area. It is about planning, being able to respond to the kind of... Um, travel to work areas that, that people might have when they're taking up new or, or additional hours. It is about um, the local strategic partners getting together and making sure that there is sufficient and accessible childcare that responds to the kind of um, jobs that people want to take up. Um, and you're right that the rapport and the relationship with work coaches or any other financial or, or other sort of expert advice is incredibly important to people who are in vulnerable circumstances, really understanding where they are now and what will help them move on. Those are the, the sort of magic things that will make a difference. Whether universal credit can be part of ensuring that those local systems work around people is, is, another, is another matter. Um, Polly Jones, yeah. I'd actually quite like to share with you a, um, a quote from somebody who we were interviewing, Steve, he's from Fife, and he said, there's a gentleman in the job centre who's worked with me in the past and he knows that I'm computer illiterate. He says, any time I go into the job centre, I don't ask for anyone else, I just say, can I speak to Alan? So we have got some good examples of um, work coaches who are clearly going, you know, beyond what they might be required to do to make sure that they can support people um, with you know, to, to fulfil the 
basic requirements and stuff. So there are, there are definitely cases of that. We've also heard cases of um, very positive feedback about particular job centres around Scotland, which people have noted because it's not the experience that they might have been used to in other job centres. And they've said, oh, that one's a really good one. And I get quite a lot of support there. So we know, I guess those good examples show us that it can be done, that there can be improvements, um, which is a good thing. But overall, um, most of the feedback is that um, that isn't how what people's experience has been. And I think it's also worth um, mentioning we've, we've worked quite closely with people from the DWP and people from job centres in the areas we're working in. And not one of those people gets up in the morning to give people who come into their, their job centre a, a hard time. You know, they are committed to trying to make it work. And that's what they would say if they were here in front of you. But there's clearly a mismatch that a lot of individuals with the lowest incomes and their experience of the system is not is not an easy one. Um, somebody else said to us, and well, they actually specifically gave us messages for people like, like you who have a, some role in decision making. They said, you know, I hope the government seemed to find a way to stop this universal credit. If not, then I don't know how everyone's going to get on. They're not going to manage. Um, that is the general perception of people in the lowest income as they've tried to navigate their way through the system. And it, it's also the position of the organisations that run the Many for Change that the, the, the universal credit, the best thing at this stage is that it should be halted, the problem's fixed before it, before it continues. Um, and it's worth not losing sight of that, I think, in the discussion about some of the detail. That, that's pretty clear. Can I just push a little bit more on how work coaches can or cannot support? Like work coaches like anyone else, they're like MSPG, good, bad and indifferent ones. It's the structure and the system that they... They, 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 they operate under as well. Um, but just that idea, if they are to be supportive, I, I don't see how that can happen in an environment where they are more detached from the communities they serve, uh, they are in larger offices, they have a more varied uh, client list in terms of the individuals they're trying to support. I would expect work coaches would need to know what a, a proper granular understanding of what local childcare provision looks like, a proper granular understanding of what local bus routes look like, of what local schools are, what, what the local economy looks like. Because it's not good enough to say there's a job three miles in that direction, why haven't you applied for it? Because it just might not fly in terms of the individual experience of the constituents that, that I have. And others may not understand that. And just my feeling is I'm not sure whether our, our work coach is getting enough training in that. Do they have enough time to do that, even if they wanted to? Are they under pressures, which means they can't deliver on the underlying principles in relation to universal credit themselves? That's probably a fair assessment. I think Russell mentioned the um, National Audit Office report, and certainly that was their concern. So whatever the report that's out today says about in-work support and its success or otherwise, um, the projection of the caseload that your average work coach will have, which has gone from being, as we've explained, sort of quite simple cases to the whole, whole spectrum of people, um, I can't see how you could give people the kind of granular or individualised or tailored support within that kind of context. I think it's going to be extremely difficult, which is why I said earlier, I think the whole system needs to come round that. It, if we're to make any success of it, the whole system needs to, to bend round that universal credit system and support. And we need to find ways of getting the most vulnerable claimants in touch with a kind of individualised and tailored support that will help them. We, we, we know from uh, some of the work with uh, uh, some job centres um, that they have been developing quite um, detailed complex needs plans so that when uh, people come in um, and they're not able to deal with everything that that person might raise in their in their session they can refer them on to and link them up with um, other services that, are, that are, might be able to help them in the local area but the whole of our project um, uh, of a menu for change has is really focused on working with a range of local services in Fife Dundee and East Ayrshire citizens advice bureaus job centres um, uh, emergency food aid suppliers, the Scottish Welfare Fund. And the picture that we're getting very clearly in those three areas and, and um, anecdotal evidence would suggest it's the same across Scotland is that that whole safety net is full of people working really, really hard, but they don't feel that they've got a very sort of simplified, coordinated, streamlined 
um, service that many of those different services aren't aware of exactly what other local services are providing at what times um, for which client groups. There's duplication, there are, there are services trying to manage uh, cuts in their own budgets and that actually, I mean, Scotland's at a very, you know, have got a great opportunity at the moment with the setting up of Social Security Scotland where you will have local delivery across the country. There seems to me quite a, an opportunity for some really um, exciting strategic thinking about how you want all of those support services to support people um, in every local area, but in terms of um, easy access to be able to get all the advice and support that you might need. Because you're right, at the moment, even for your um, constituents in, in the, cent you know, the centre of Glasgow, you may well have bus journeys to get to different offices that you need to see to fill in particular forms to help you with different bits of support. Um, they might have different opening times. That doesn't necessarily fit with your childcare or your work commitment. So there's, there's, a, there's a job to be done to really try and um, streamline and ensure that there's a safety net in across all local areas in Scotland that works for people who are needing it and that isn't just designed around services that have developed over a number of years, um, maybe in isolation from each other. Uh, George Adam. Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning. I just thought I would uh, ask, if we already, just to go back of Shona's question, when we talked about the how universal universal credits, uh, impacts and barriers faced by women, but also there's uh, those with disabilities and carers as well. Do you have any information you can tell us today with regards to that, these impacts, or can you get us that information as well? Um, possibly a, a combination of both. Um, so, um, certainly we are worried in JRF about the impact on people with disabilities and more vulnerable clients generally um, the experience to date has been has been quite challenging um, it's a challenging system to interact with so the more barriers or the, the more vulnerable your circumstances the more likely it is that it's, it's going to be difficult for you um, and certainly there's a significant proportion of people who um, end up being destitute um, who also have significant health concerns and that, that cycling in and out of poverty that we talked about is a specific concern for, for that group also. Um, I'm certainly happy to follow up with more detailed information um, if, if you would... That's obviously a difficult issue because there's a lot of carers out there that just do it they look after the person in their family and don't see themselves as a carer. So uh, is that an issue that we obviously need to obviously the Scottish Government's uh, uh, issue and uh, Westminster, but is there not a way we can... can uh, that's a serious issue from the fact that these people just go about their business day in, day out, and how do we identify these individuals and how does the system get to them? That's lots of different questions. Oh. <laughs> um, I think for this specific theme about in-work poverty, um, carers are often um, in the background, as you say, just getting on with the job of caring, but they may also be a key feature of the kinds of households where one person is, is working um, who are in poverty, who are unable to increase their hours or do more work, for whom work is an, an additional option for them, and they are a specific group that are at risk of poverty, yes. Um, and there, there's lots that that the Scottish Government has already committed to doing around, around supporting carers and, and bringing up the level of their financial support to that of um, JSA claimants. But there's probably more that we could do to identify hidden carers, yes. Um, specifically on um, people's, people's experience of using or not having enough money for food um, and where they have disabilities, that has come out very clearly in our research and evidence that... Um, the most common source of income for households making applications, for example, for crisis grants to the Scottish Welfare Fund are um, people uh, who've got disabilities. Um, so we know that they're more vulnerable, often more vulnerable to income crises. Um, and uh, they're also over, way overrepresented um, amongst food bank users, people with disabilities. It's also worth drawing out that um, people um, experiencing problems of men with mental health comes up again and again in uh, the group of people who are left with no money for food and who just seem to be falling through all of the cracks in the various safety nets that um, are meant to pick us all up. OK, Michelle Ballantyne. Those statements you've just made, are you referring to people who are on UC or people who are yet to go on to UC? Um, uh, 
I don't know. And this is from this is from wider uh, food bank evidence that isn't specific to universal credit. I, I think that's the point, isn't it? Because you know, the, a lot of these people are, are, are not on UC; they're on other forms of benefit or not on benefit. So, so that's a that's a much bigger issue here than than an impact of UC on on these particular individuals. And in terms of your food bank evidence, and, and I'm particularly interested, I'm the patron of a food bank and work very closely with them. Um, and one of the big problems is actually good evidence from food banks because they're often not actually recording why people are coming. You know, they don't have good evidence of, of what the reason is for being there. Most of it's anecdotal. And when we started looking at it and doing some work, there was quite a broad range. Um, and if we're going to really tackle some of these problems, we really need to understand what the causes are. And, and understand them properly. I agree. I don't think you mm. can fix a problem until you can measure it. Um, but, mm. uh, I mean, I, I don't work for the Trussell Trust, but the Trussell Trust who've produced... And may, maybe the food bank you're a patron of is part of that network. So they do, um, they do record in quite a lot of detail um, exactly who's coming, partly because many, from, for many of the, the Trussell Trust food banks, you're not entitled to a food parcel unless you've got a referral voucher from another agency. So there's quite a, quite a clear, rigorous process for recording where someone's come from and what the reason was for them coming um, in order for them to be seen to be entitled to a, to a, a food parcel. Just this week, actually, we've uh, launched some research across Scotland for independent food banks because that's uh, over a third of, of emergency food aid providers in Scotland and, and to date hasn't been mapped. So hopefully the food bank you're involved with will be able to participate in that and then we'll have um, uh, very, very robust data. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Michelle Robinson? On that point, I, I take Michelle Ballantyne's point, but I think earlier on in your evidence, uh, Paul, you said that um, in relation to the Trussell Trust, they had made a very direct link to where the universal credit rollout was with an increase in um, the um, referrals to, to food banks. Presumably then <coughs> the, the evidence of the, from the, the research that you're talking about in terms of the independent food banks would potentially give us some of that information about whether or not there's the, 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 re the research from the Trussell Trust is in line with any research from the independent food banks, although I would find it hard to believe that food banks would operate in such a radically different way. And it would be helpful maybe from the, for the committee, if we don't have it already, to get some of that detailed research from Trussell Trust about the links with universal credit. 52% increase was, a, was looking at what had happened in food banks where universal credit had been full service for 12 months. So it's not data from a month, it's 12 months of evidence. So that, that I don't think is um, disputable. Um, they've also uh, worked with a number of academics from the University of Oxford in particular, but lots of other universities that do leading work on food insecurity um, and who, who've done uh, studies over a number of years to, to look at exactly what the relationship is between who is, who is left with no money for food, who is turned to food banks, who actually is, has no money for food but doesn't go to food banks, because that actually is probably the, the real tragedy, that most people don't, don't go to food banks. It's not, it's not um, a place that they would turn to. And often, I mean, certainly in our evidence, we've got a lot of, a lot of women again who, you know, they feed the children, they feed the partner, there's no food left, and so they drink tea or weekend. OK, thank you. Alice Rowan. I was really going to ask the same question that Sean Robinson uh, raised, but I mean, on picking up on the, the last point you've made there about people who don't use food bags, and of course, valuable as the work that food banks do is, we shouldn't regard them as part of the benefit system, and I hope there's kind of universal agreement on that. Mm -hmm. um, there is also, I am sure, replicated in other places compared to the place I live, and I'm sure it's, it's not radically different in other places, the phenomenon where. Uh, older people, particularly, would rather be hungry than claim food from a food bank in many cases. Now, I'm not advocating that position, but culturally, for all sorts of reasons, there are people who prefer the sensation of hunger, such is their dislike of having to be put in the position of claiming food on a charitable basis. Now, I, as I say, I don't advocate that position, but, but how do we cope, or how do we reach people who, for all of those cultural reasons, simply will not go to a food bank? 
The, um, I mean, I think the Scottish Government has really taken the lead on uh, recognising why we want to build a robust safety net that catches everybody so nobody needs to turn to a food bank. For the, for the last few years, there was a, an independent working group was set up to look particularly at food insecurity back in 2015, and they produced a report with a number of very clear recommendations which the Scottish Government endorsed. And our project really came in on the back of that, looking at how to put some of those into, into practice. Um, and... I mean, most food bank volunteers would say themselves to you if they were here, well, we, we never did set this up to be a long-term solution. We stepped in temporarily, and oh, what on earth are we doing still here 10 years later? So I think there's, um, there's a, lot of, a lot of commitment in Scotland, which is slightly different to the rest of the UK, a lot of commitment in Scotland to try and build a system that... Um, supports everybody, with the, with the focus being on income maximisation, actually. And I think that the, you know, the recent commitments to do the financial um, health checks for families is, on low income is, is fantastic. It's something we would like to see rolled out for everybody, not just families, because um, it's certainly the case that many people presenting um, at food banks at the moment, but also the sort of many people who were in the first wave of, of universal credit were, were single men. And um, we would want them to also be having a financial health check to make sure they're not missing out on benefits. Um, and I think as we see the increase of uh, poverty for people in wo work, we know that most people in work maybe haven't had an experience of using a social security system and our systems aren't set up, maybe even with simple things like opening hours to make it easy for people to access that other support to make sure that they've got everything that they're entitled to, that they're getting all the benefits and support they're entitled to. So I think the focus of for Scotland and for the rest of the UK should be about how do we make sure we haven't got a leaky safety net so that people have their income maximised, the people with lowest income have their income maximised um, and they've got everything they're entitled to and don't need to turn to food banks at all. I'm just interested um, in what the picture looks like if we don't fix this problem. And so everyone's used examples. Uh, I'm sure other members have had people come to them. I've certainly had numerous cases of single parents in particular with rising housing costs who have been working and haven't been on universal credit, but have been in receipt of other tax credits, will now be brought into the universal credit system. It seems to me to be a bit crazy to upset that. But life is not simple for anyone, is it? And a lot of these families... Uh, increasing number of children with um, rising medical problems, the increase in um, inflammatory bowel disease, the increase in uh, diagnosis of um, Asperger's and other difficulties. And I've had three families in the last two weeks come to me with children um, that, that, that also got the added complication of managing that and they're having to go to work full time because the system has completely changed. And I think it's important to highlight that we're dealing with in-work poverty um, for, for, for those who were previously in work and not on the benefit system trying to get into work. I think it's an important aspect of it. But I just wondered what you thought the picture looks like going forward. And I think it would be helpful for the committee to try and identify the groups that you think would be most at risk. I know you've said some of it in your paper, but I just wanted to be clear because I think it's important to have that picture going forward. Um, yes, so I think actually the Poverty and Inequality Commission have set out what they see on the basis of some of the evidence that your former witnesses have um, have been doing about the, the groups and the kinds of households that are most at risk, and they are the ones that that you would imagine. So lone parents, larger families, some BME, and families where there is disability or long-term ill health. These are all vulnerabilities, um, vulnerable circumstances that that mean that the rollout of a, a less generous system, as it as it is in many cases, is going to be particularly difficult. So, um, like Polly, I think our organisation will probably ask um, that universal credit at, at full service at at full rollout is just paused at the, the end of the year so that we get a sense of what that wider impact will be before it's before we start the managed migration process and bringing in those groups that, as you say, haven't yet um, 
haven't yet been touched by the system. Um, largely because of the, the sort of numbers and the complexities of those cases, it would make sense to let the system bed down first um, for all those new claimants and, and while full service um, kicks in. You're right, individual households are often dealing with a, a, multiple, a, a multitude of, of challenges, whether that's housing or a disabled child or what have you, and we do need a system that can be sufficiently responsive to all of those circumstances and make sure that, that um, families can, can um, move out of, out of poverty. And as you say, the, almost the majority of, of lone parents nearly are actually already working. So JRF published a report recently which basically set out of the parents who are doing what the system universal credit requires of them, in terms of working hours, um, the majority of them are still in poverty. They're, they're not actually being able to move out of poverty. So whilst I absolutely agree with Polly that we need to, at the very least, make sure that the social security system that we design or the systems that we bring together create an effective safety net, we also want to pick up the issues from the first session and make sure it's not just a safety net, but it's actually a platform onto something that's better. Um, and we need to get both of those things right at the moment. As you say, it's, it's a leaky net. We're, we're losing people and often some of the most vulnerable people. But when we redesign that process, particularly in Scotland, we want to make sure that people can progress and that they can actually have a better prospect, um, not just move into in-work poverty, which is obviously the inquiry's focus at the moment. Thank you very much. The only thing I just wanted to add was um, that some of the evidence that we've been picking up has been around the arrears that people have been getting into with their rent people in private housing. Um, they make up the fastest growing proportion of people in, in experiencing in-work poverty. And certainly we've seen um, many people very quickly because their rent is included within their universal credit payment, that they, they're building up arrears with, with their landlords. And um, you know, Hillary, for example, said to us, the reason I have to go to the food bank is because I'm in rent arrears, which means I'm paying my rent and my rent arrears off universal credit. And then there's, there's not much more left left to go round. And we um, were particularly interested in a freedom of inf information request that was put in at the beginning of the year to all local authorities in Scotland, which found that nine local authorities had set aside nine million pounds in their budgets um, to cope with the rollout of universal credit and what that would mean specifically in terms of rent arrears owed to local authorities in Scotland as a result of, um, of, of universal credit rollout. So, I think that, that really highlights a reason to focus on what's happening with housing costs, um, again, for people at the sort of lowest end of the income scale, but also it demonstrates the interrelationship between the um, UK-wide benefit system and universal credit, local authorities and individuals and, the, and um, their experience of uh, the private rented sector. Thank you. Can, can I ask a, a question? I'm my head around what what universal credit is meaning for those that are moving on to who are, who are in work and haven't experienced it before, um, and the idea of conditionality and that, that contract between the person in work previously receiving working tax credits or child tax credits independently of this whole universal credit system. So the idea of um, pathways out of poverty, the idea of career progression uh, and conditions put on, so if someone if a single mum is, is, is in receipt of, of universal credit and for the last year, year and a half, has been holding down a minimum wage, wage job full-time, pretty difficult circumstances, but is getting some form of benefit through universal credit, who decides whether or not she's trying hard enough to move away from a minimum, a minimum wage full-time job? Who decides whether or not there's actually a job out there that wouldn't make that single mother and her children worse off in a variety of ways, including financially, should she seek to take something else. The job might not even exist. Who's qualified to make that judgment when deciding to put conditionality on someone's universal credit claim? Who has that expertise and who, who would be doing it? Theory, work coaches will be doing it. Um, I don't think there's an enormous amount of evidence about uh, about how they will go about doing that simply because of where we are in terms of rollout and, and who's been picked up um, at this stage. So one of the things that JRF is doing is it is um, commissioning at the moment some work to um, 
follow the rollout of Universal Credit in Glasgow, for example. Um, so you heard from earlier witnesses that some of the evidence and some of the challenges and some of the very, very terrible stories um, perhaps relate to universal credit in its design and in its rollout at an earlier stage, that some of those uh, tweaks and flaws have been, has been fixed or ameliorated in some way, and that um, it will be better from now on. So one of the things that we will want to do in our, you know, our um, small project in Glasgow is just assess the universal credit as it's implemented now and see, see what impact that will have. But one slice of that will be sitting down with work coaches if we can and getting a sense of how prepared they are to support that wider cohort of people, including people in work, um, what resources they have at their disposal to be able to make those kinds of decisions and what help they're able to draw on in order to help the clients that, that they'll be working with. Um, I'll be happy to report back how far we get with those discussions in, in due course. But I, th I think that is a concern. What we know is that if help is tailored for individual people, if it reflects their circumstances, if it comes from a place which is, we would like you and your family to get the best deal for you, um, as the other witnesses have said, lone parents and other kinds of families tend to be very sensitive to economic incentives and, and prospects to improve their family. Nobody gets up in the morning and says, how can I, how can I screw over the UK government today? So. Uh, I think designing a system that is much more um, supportive. <laughs> the, I'm just, glad just to have provided the only laugh on this subject just, so far. Just, just for those reading the official report, <laughs> there was lots of nodding heads when that previous statement was. was I do was hope made. I have a job when I go back to the office. Um, <laughs> Yes, so we know that you can do that in a way that is very supportive and enabling for families. The question is, if you've got a caseload as a work coach, you've got a caseload of 290 people to support, how, how are you going to be able to spend that time individually with people to, to do that? And, and what we know from other kinds of programmes and other kinds of interventions, particularly with lone parents who are particularly hardest hit, is that it is better. You get better outcomes if you're able to um, get people into the right job for their circumstances rather than, rather than any job. Polly Jones. Just um, a, a couple of things to share. Uh, somebody said to us that um, their work coach... Had, um, I was told that if I walked out of my job, I'd get sanctioned by the job centre, and I said, how can you sanction me when I don't have any hours? So somebody who had a zero-hours contract um, and wanted to leave it because she didn't have any hours, but as far as her work coach was concerned, that was equivalent to actually walking out of the job, and therefore she would be sanctioned on the top of it. So there are, there are clearly some problems with how some of the, some of the um, sanctioning works around changing work, in work contracts like zero hours contracts and someone else who said to us that they come off universal credit because I was still expected to go look for work up to a certain amount of hours and for £1.35 I didn't see the point because that meant I had to spend all that money to get data for the internet which wasn't worth it. So for some people the advice that they've been given from their work coaches doesn't actually make financial sense to be doing that. It's not, it, it's not, the, not the sensible logical strategy cut both ways. Sometimes the, the, the advice might be flawed because the, the work coach simply doesn't have the time to look in detail at what a sensible solution would look like for 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 the client or it could be a, a lack of training or uh, I, mean, I mean it does all seem to hang on if we get the structures right if, leave that hanging there, a lot then depends on a trusting, professional compassionate and supportive relationship between the work coach and the individual. And it's how you actually legislate and build structures around that, because when you put in those relationships, those vary so greatly. Is there anything additional that you believe could be put in to support that? We, we touched earlier on the fluctuations in people's income. I think designing a system that has a little bit of flex in it is incredibly important because people's circumstances change and they're often um, dealing with quite difficult circumstances at home. Um, so a system that doesn't react too quickly, doesn't, doesn't overreact with, with um, claimants, I think would also be very helpful. That might be an area that the Scottish 
Parliament can do more about, to smooth out some of the peaks and troughs for people um, and to, to provide some wider wraparound and have a little bit... Uh, react just a little bit less quickly to changes in circumstances that enable people to have a little bit of space to breathe. Thank you. A um, couple more questions. And oh, sorry, Polly Jones, did you want in there? My apologies. A couple of things that um, have been quite clear in the um, evidence we've been picking up. One is around the issue of implicit consent. Um, with universal credit, advisors, for example, people who might work in a council welfare rights unit or uh, within the Citizen Advice Bureau, were able to access the system to see what the current status of somebody's benefits were, which is really, really important because they may well be your first port of call if you were having a problem and you wanted it fixed. With universal credit, they don't have implicit consent. The only person who has implicit consent is your MP. Now, I'm sure our MPs don't really want to be the first port of call for all of these issues and it seems to me a very straightforward point to try and extend implicit consent so that advisors can support people who are struggling and have got questions about universal credit so that's something specific also um it's um really important that the safety net built in through universal credit is within the DWP is, is maximised as well. So there are short-term benefit advances and hardship payments that should be available to everybody who is having an income crisis. Um, and we would want to be confident that those are always made available and explained to somebody who might be in, in having a, a, an income crisis, have no money for food, that those are available. And that isn't always the case at the moment. Thank you. Now, just apologies, Deborah, if you went to come in there. Just because of time constraints, I've got two further questions intimated by, by members, and then after that we'll have to close the session because we're running up quite close towards uh, Parliament starting. So it'll be Jeremy Balfour followed by uh, Alison Johnson. Uh, thank you. I mean, a bit of a Darth Laddie question. I mean, clearly your reports highlight the negative experiences that people have had. It's a bit like MSPs, you know, no one ever comes to us when we've had a positive experience and say, wasn't it such a great experience? Have you, do you record positive experiences at all or do you simply put them to a side so that your report reads in a certain way? Um, and if so, are you able to share some of those with the committee? Um, so JRF did some work with Britain Thinks and it was able to, it did some work with individual claimants um, and there were positive experiences. It wasn't, it wasn't totally negative and um, the organisation has been able to share those. Um, the profile of the people who had positive experiences tended to be people without any additional barriers um, who were working um, and for whom uh, I, uh, high quality internet connection and all of the things that enabled them as a household to interact with the system were all relatively straightforward. Some of those claimants had a perfectly positive experience. That wasn't the case for people who had a different kind of profile. So um, other people who, f for all of the reasons that we've talked about, whether it's fluctuating earnings, very vulnerable circumstances, um, disability or ill health, um, without direct access to the internet at home, all of those kinds of things. <laughs> But you say that everybody that falls into the categories that you say had a negative experience? No, it wasn't that. Could that's just what you just said. You said everybody that has low internet access or single parent or that has had a negative experience. Just to yeah. see what she said. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, Deborah. Apologies if I misrepresented that. What I meant to say was that the report says that you are far more likely to have. A, challenges interacting with the system if you have any kind of vulnerability, you have poor quality internet access, and that conversely, people who didn't have those challenges were more likely, um, this being a qualitative focus group, were more likely to um, rate the service as, as positive. Um, uh, if the people that we're working with are, are only people who are left with no money for food, so it's worth bearing in mind that our comments come from uh, research with that particular group of people. But even in this session, um, I've been quite clear about feeding back and sharing with you the positive experience someone had with their work coach in a job centre about how they'd gone out of their way to help them navigate an online system. And also one particular job centre where we'd had um, 
from lots of people we'd interviewed, they'd all said, well, what's happened to that job centre? It's brilliant. It's a totally different experience. And not only have I shared that, obviously, with you today, we went and spoke to uh, DWP people uh, managing DWP across Scotland and also that job centre to feed that back to them because we wanted them to know that people's experience of that, that particular centre was something positive that could possibly be looked at to see how it, how it could be shared across Scotland. So absolutely, when there's good, great positive feedback, we want, we, want to, we want to see that all across Scotland, not just hidden in, in um, some qualitative research and a report on a bookshelf. That's, that's how we learn and make it better. Balfour? Yeah, Alison George. Thank you. Uh, I was just going to raise the issue of implied consent because we had taken evidence from, I think it was organisations in Musselburgh on the impact that was having and the fact that the fact that explicit consent is insisted upon for, for full service, I think it's probably having an impact on our our correspondence as well. Um, so thank you for raising that. Um, I just, you mentioned earlier the impact that you see was having on rent arrears. Um, do you have any understanding of how easy it is for people to ensure that payment goes directly to the landlords? Is that something that they're made aware of? Is it quite straightforward? So, yeah. um, the issue of Scottish flexibility is, is very interesting. Um, it's certainly situated in the Scottish Government Act, which is we know that uh, we can see that for, for many individuals it can make a big difference to how they can budget um, because the money obviously gives them the option for the money to go straight to their landlord. So that's also a good thing. But um, it seems less clear about how um, easy it is for people to be given the information that, that Scottish Flexibilities is available. My understanding is that um, you would be asked about it after your second visit and asked about it once. Um, and it seems to me that this is the kind of thing that you might need, you might want the option to be asked about at many different times through your experience. And that there's clearly there's some um, some work between the DWP and the Scottish Government about how Scottish flexibilities are um, embedded within a system that otherwise is being developed by, delivered by the DWP. But that seems to me something that we want to keep an eye on to make sure that it's not a one-time only opportunity to take up that offer, but that your work coach is in a position to be able to encourage you to um, make sure that you've got that information so that you can decide if that would make your situation better. OK, um, just we have... Very limited time left. We're we all done with our questions. Is there anything you want to put on the record before we close this evidence session, uh, Polly or Deborah, that you don't feel you have the opportunity to put on as yet? Not, not that I'm... I've taken a note of a couple of things to follow up, some specific pieces of information to follow up, which I will, I will do. OK. And I, sorry, Polly. I think just, just one thing, which is that, obviously, universal credit is, is a reserved matter. Um, and I think... Uh, for, for Many for Change and our work across Scotland, very much our focus has been um, how can, what action can be taken at a local level across Scotland that makes a difference right now to people on the lowest income. So even when some of the issues may be caused by or the result of uh, UK-wide policies, what action can be taken now? And I, and I think that's something certainly we included in our submission of evidence to your committee. There are clearly clear policy opportunities that the Scottish Government has to mitigate and support people who might be struggling with the rollout of universal credit. And you've touched on these. I, w I won't spend much time so I'll just give you a quick list, but um, you've touched on some of these before, about the Scottish Welfare Fund. How can you make sure that nobody, everyone who's eligible can benefit from that, and particularly that people in work may be able to benefit from it? How you might invest in advice services to really give that coordinated wraparound support um, for every community in Scotland? Um, looking at uh, what you can do through public procurement um, contracts and making sure that everybody who is employed through a public procurement contract um, benefits from the real living wage, um, encouraging more employers to pick up and pay the real living wage, making sure everyone that um, is eligible is aware of Scottish flexibilities. And lastly, you've got a number of bills going through Parliament at the moment, the um, Fuel Poverty Bill, the Transport Bill, even the Good Food Nation Bill, whatever its current status is, all of those give you opportunities to look at how those different... Um, those different costs for people on the lowest income can be um, reduced or limited so that they can participate in society just like everybody else.
That's helpful. I, I should point out, please do follow this inquiry. Uh, do feel free to give an additional written submission and, and, and keep that communication going. And we'll, we'll, listen, we'll listen carefully to what you've said here this morning. But time is upon us, I'm afraid. So I do have to close this evidence session. So thank you to Polly Jones and Deborah Hay for coming along this morning. And uh, we now move into uh, agenda item five, which we've agreed to take in private. Thank you.